Saul is dead, and David was promised the kingdom. David's troubles seem over, but are they really? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, Dr. J. Vernon McGee takes us to 2 Samuel chapters 2 and 3, where we learn that David's troubles are actually just beginning. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus for another great study in God's Word. And as you find your seat, here's a couple of quick emails from our fellow passengers on the Bible bus. First, here's one from Dan. He says, 50 years ago, my parents would take my brothers and me to evening service at Church of the Open Door to hear Dr. McGee preach. It was there as a young teenager sitting in the balcony that I heard the gospel. I made a decision to ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. You see, the church we attended on Sunday mornings taught moral lessons and said we should do good things, but did not speak of our lost and sinful life if not redeemed by the blood of Jesus. All these years later, I am so happy to now be on the Bible bus. Listening online is so easy, and I am happy to follow through for the next five years if God so grants me life. I'm recovering from cancer treatments, and audio is much easier for me than reading now. The Bible bus is helping my walk in recovery and dealing with ongoing pain and the uncertainty of cancer treatment. God is my treasure and sure rock. Well, agreed, Dan. God is our rock, isn't he? May you be blessed as you take strength in God's word. Here's another great email. This is from a listener who joins us in her language of Albanian. She writes, I'm 24 years old and started listening to your program last year when I received a solar radio. From your program, I understood that a believer's life is not perfect. I still have to go through problems and struggles, but there is a way to triumph in every situation, and that way is only Jesus. I've learned that God is very faithful with all of us. It doesn't matter where we come from or what we have done. I have recently started going to church and am grateful to you for showing me the truth and making it possible for me to know about eternal life through Jesus. Well, isn't that a great letter? We'll learn more about how God uses our problems and struggles today as we study the life of David together. So let's pray and get to it. Heavenly Father, your word helps us to see clearly your hand working through history and to provide salvation for everyone who calls on you in faith. May there be many who hear and respond today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, today we begin our study in the second chapter of 2 Samuel. And if you have your Bible handy, you'll want to turn there and follow along with us because we're in a very interesting section, and I trust you have our notes and outlines. And if you do not have it, why, we have a copy for you and invite you to write in and ask for your copy. Now, as we come today to this chapter, let me remind you that last time, as we opened the chapter, we saw that the grief of David at the death of Saul and Jonathan, and his grief was genuine. Certainly no one would question it in reference to Jonathan, for Jonathan and David were wonderful friends. Jonathan was a sort of John the Baptist to David, and he knew he would be the next king, and pledged his full support to him in that effort when he became king. Now that Saul is dead, the question comes to David, should he return back to the land, back to the promised land? You remember he had a lapse of faith, and he moved out of the land temporarily, went into the land of the Philistines, and almost got into the position of fighting his own people. God delivered him from that. But we're going to see that he got in trouble also. We'll be dealing with that shortly. Now, here in chapter 2, I begin reading at verse 1. It came to pass after this, that is, after the death of Saul and Jonathan and the grief of David for that, that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, Unto Hebron. Now this is all quite interesting, for you may wonder, well, why does David ask the question? He's in the Philistine country. Saul and Jonathan are dead. David is to be the next king. Now what will be his move? He waits until 
he gets instructions from the Lord. David has learned that he must wait on the Lord in a very definite way. Now I read, so David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahanoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. Now, you'll notice David takes up these two women who were his wives at this time. Someone is going to say, does God approve of two wives? No. Fact of the matter is, all of this is going to cause David a great deal of trouble because he has other wives also. Now, as I read, and his men that were with him did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. Now, here we have something else that we need to note is that David went up, and his mighty men went up, and God told him to go to Hebron. Hebron is on the border. He was down in the Philistine country, actually not too far from here. And God is telling him to move cautiously, not to go up and arbitrarily take over, but to move up into the land to make himself available. And when he does, we find that the tribe of Judah makes him king. Now we have in verse 5, And David sent messengers unto the man of Jabesh Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. Now David does a very wise thing. The men who buried Saul were men, naturally, who were devoted to him. And David now thanks them for it. Because after all, David had a great respect for the anointed of the Lord. He had two opportunities to slay him and make himself king, but he did not do that. The good points of David apparently are generally passed by because the sin of David obscures everything. It's like a cloud that covers the sky and shuts out the sunshine that is in his life. David was a very wonderful man. This was one great sin in his life that he paid for every day of his life after that. Now he compliments these men. Now we are told, now the Lord had showed kindness and truth to you. David now is complimenting these men. And I also will requite you this kindness because you've done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened. Be ye valiant man, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah hath anointed me king over them. In other words, David asks for their support and for their devotion to him as king as they'd given it unto Saul. And you notice that he's moving in a very diplomatic and I believe a very commendable manner at this time. Now we recognize that Saul and also Jonathan had sons, and they would be the normal ones to come to the throne had not God intervened. And Abner, who had been the captain of Saul's host, moves immediately to make one of them king. And notice what he does. Verse 8, and I'm reading it. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and made him king over Gilead, and over the Azurites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Here is the beginning of the division of the kingdom, which will come after the reign of Solomon, when Jeroboam leads a rebellion again. But here is the fracture at this time. At first, David is made king over the southern kingdom of Judah. But the ten northern tribes now make Ishbosheth, who is a son of Saul, make him king. And what happens? We're told, but the house of Judah followed David. 
and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now, this was an interval of civil war. That is, war between the northern kingdom and David and Judah in the south. And it depleted the resources and the energy of the nation. It was indeed a very tragic sort of thing. Now will you note what happened? And Abner the son of Ner and the servants of Ish-bosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Maonabian to Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zeruah and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. Now they were attempting, first of all, by negotiation to work out something to prevent a civil war. But as you well know, and certainly we in this country ought to have learned by now, that when you have folk on one side who are determined on one course and people on the other side determined on another course, that negotiation is practically valueless. It's generally an exercise in futility, and that is exactly what this will be. Now, you will notice verse 13, And Joab, the son of Zeruah, and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool. They sat down, one on the one side, the other on the other side of the pool. Abner said to Joab, Let the young man now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. In other words, let the young man now come together. Then they arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ish-bosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one of his fellow by the head, thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. In other words, they were going to let this be the way of settling it. It was a sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten in the men of Israel before the servants of David. They tricked David at the beginning, but David was prepared for this type of trickery, and so he immediately was able to engage him in battle. Now, actually, you have a veteran of many campaigns now. David is not the little innocent shepherd boy that we met at the beginning. He's now a veteran who has spent time hiding in the caves and dens of the earth, who's collected men of war around him, and he's a rugged man now and adept at this type of warfare. And so he was able to get victory over Abner and the host, that is, a superior number. Now you have an incident that took place, and I merely call attention to it because it is to play a very prominent part a little later on. Azahel was following Abner, and Azahel was a brother of Joab. This man Joab was David's captain, and Abner was Saul's captain, and he's the one that's leading. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Azahel would not turn aside from following of him. In other words, Azahel took out after Abner, and Abner turned around and said, Quit following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? And he was no match for him at all. And finally, Abner turned around and drove a spear through him. And that means he's killed the brother of Joab. Now that means that in Joab's heart, there will be this bitterness and hatred and a desire to get revenge. And it will come later on. Now that is the end of this chapter. We have the funeral of Azahel and Joab and his men went all night. They came to Hebron at break of day, and they reported to David all that had taken place. Now we are told something in chapter 3 of the family of David in Hebron, and here's where I want you to see something that is all important, by the way. I read in verse 1 here, and this is important for you and me to note. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. 
But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. This is the condition, internal strife, civil war, and the nation's energies are being depleted, and of course their resources are being exhausted at this time. Now we're told that while David spent this seven and a half years in the city of Hebron, we're told in verse 2, and under David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Ammon of Ahanoam, the Jezreelites. His second was Kileab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. Now you can see David had more than the two wives. He had these others. And this will be the thing that's going to cause a great problem for David. David didn't get by with this, and God did not approve of it. And we find that among these boys that are listed here is one by the name of Absalom, and I'm sure you are familiar with this story. A little later on, we'll see him lead a rebellion against David. We'll see that this is the boy that was brutally killed by Joab in battle, and that this young man was apparently the one David wanted to follow him to become the king. I'm of the opinion that David wanted this boy to be the one to follow him, and it broke his heart when he was slain. But who is he? Well, he's the son, we're told here, of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. Well, who's the king of Geshur? Well, if you go back into 1 Samuel, in the 27th chapter, verse 8, you will find out that when David had gone out of the land, that he carried war against the king of Geshur. And I think he was in the wrong position altogether and doing a wrong thing. And he slew these people and the king of Geshur, but took apparently his daughter to wife. And this son is the one that led the rebellion against him. David, my friend, did not get by with it, and God saw to it that he did not get by with it at all. This is something very important for you and me to note that he did not get by with it. Now we have something else that happens in this chapter that is of great significance. This is a long civil war, and in many ways very uninteresting as far as you and I are concerned. Now what happened was this, that Abner, who had been the chief captain of King Saul, now he's been pushing the son of Saul, Ishbosheth, on the throne. And naturally, being an older man and having had such a high position, he's not apt to listen to this young king, and he does something that he should have been forbidden to do. Now, notice we're told that. Verse 7, And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth, and he said, Am I a dog's head which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father to his brethren and his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? In other words, Abner's saying, this is none of your business. I'll do as I please. And he did not appreciate the rebuke that the young king has given him. But candidly, the young king is justified in the thing that he's saying and in the thing that he's doing here. Now we are told that immediately Abner begins to make overtures to David. And the thing that happened is this. We are told in verse 9, so do God to Abner and more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him. In other words, this man says, I'm going over to David. To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul 
and to set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. And that would include, of course, the 12 tribes. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. Now, this young man, Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, he had no army and he had no training whatsoever. He was not like Saul and Jonathan, the oldest son. He was one that had been brought up in the king's palace. Now, Abner sent messages to David on his behalf saying, whose is the land? And he says, make a league with me. Now, David said this to him. He says in verse 13, thou shall not see my face except thou first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. In other words, she was the one that was given to him at first, the first wife, then Saul took her away from David. Believe me, this man David had a checkered career. My friend, this is the reason God wouldn't let him build a temple. And the reason that this man suffered as he did is because of the sin that entered his life. But above it all, there was a faith in this man's life that never failed. And he wanted, above all else, to have a wonderful relationship with God. And so Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Phaeltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her, to Behurim. Then said Abner unto him, Go return, and he returned. Now we find that there is this overture made, it is accepted, and we find now that David will become king of all 12 of the tribes because actually of the treachery of this man Abner. Now Joab hasn't forgotten that his own brother had been slain. And so we read, when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib and he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Now, when David heard it, David did not approve of it at all. In fact, the matter is he accused Joab of doing a very terrible thing. But the thing that he said concerning the death of Abner is quite interesting. And in closing, I'd like for you to notice it. In verse 33, And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth. Now, why did he say that? That's a strange epitaph to give any person. Died Abner as a fool dieth. Well, he was in Hebron. Hebron was one of the cities of refuge where a murderer was safe. And this man, Abner, if he'd stayed inside of the city, would have been perfectly safe, and Joab could not have touched him. But Joab very quietly took him aside, says, come out here, I want to talk with you. Now that you are, were captain on the other side, I'm the captain over here. Oh, why, it'll be nice if we get together. And so he attempts to get together with him, and he kills him. Well, may I say to you, he had left the city of refuge. Is that a message for us today? There is a refuge for the sinner. That's in Christ. You want to know God's evaluation of the man today? And I don't care how high his IQ might be, and I don't care what his position is. The man that will not turn to Christ in these days, he's the place of refuge for sinners. David said of Abner, died Abner as a fool died. And if the truth was told at many funerals today, the preacher or whoever is speaking would have to say, a fool has just died. He would not turn to Jesus Christ, a place of refuge. Today, are you resting in Christ, the place of refuge? Well, we'll be right back here again next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. If you'd like to know more about the refuge we find in Jesus, visit ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? At the beginning of his teaching, Dr. McGee mentioned his notes and outlines for 2 Samuel. Well, you can download them right away at ttb.org when you click on the link for our free digital book, Briefing the Bible. Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll send an abridged paperback copy by mail to you for free. You can also write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. 
Israel and Judah are at war. But next time, we'll see how they're united under the kingship of David. Join me for another exciting study in 2 Samuel. Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed at what God teaches you from his word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.